right screen going here for you. But today's study is going to be called The Eyes of Yahweh. The Eyes of Yahweh. And um, I want to ask this question. Let's suppose that um, there is this fellow with a video camera following us around every minute of every day and recording everything we did at home, everything we did at work, everything and everywhere we walked, it was broadcast on uh, live television where everything was written down and recorded. And um, try to think of that for a moment. And now my question is, if this was really the case, would you do anything differently than you do now? Would you change anything? What if everything you did and thought was going to be broadcast on the national news? Would your conduct be any different? Would you speak any differently about, the, about your thoughts if they were broadcast? Would you be thinking a little differently than you do? Would you do anything differently? Would you be a little bit better at overcoming temptation during the time that you knew you were being recorded on camera? And so, if the answer is yes, I think it's a good idea to ask ourselves a question. Are we fearing man more than we're fearing Yahweh? Yahushua said in Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, it says, In the meantime, when an innumerable company multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another. He began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. And what you have spoken in the ear of the in inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who after he is killed has the power to cast into Gehinnom. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Do we, brothers and sisters, have a right fear of Elohim? And are we aware of his presence continually? That's an important question that we need to ask ourselves. Now, Gehinnom is commonly translated hell. But Gehinnom is, the, is, is actually the Valley of Hinnom. And the Valley of Hinnom um, is spoken of in these places in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament. It says in Second Chronicles chapter 28, verses 1-2, through 2, it says, Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what is right in the sight of Yahweh as his father David had done. For he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made molded images for the Baals. He burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burned his children in the fire according to the abominations whom Yahweh had cast out before the children of Israel. Now you see here that the valley of the son of Hinnom, and actually Hinnom means lamentations, and uh, it, he burned his children there in the fire in that same place that's, that Yahshua was speaking of when he said that 
this is where Yahweh has the power to destroy men in the, in the valley of Hinnom. Also, uh, 2 Chronicles 33, verse 6, speaking of Manasseh, it says, He caused his sons to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom, practiced soothsaying, witchcraft, sorcery, consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the sight of Yahweh to provoke him to anger. And then Josiah came along, and it says he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the son of Hanom, that no man might make his son or daughter pass through the fire to Molech. And so this was an awful place, brothers. It had, a, had an awful history of innocent blood being shed and, um, and the evil of men doing evil there. And at the time of uh, Yahshua, the um, the actual place was was a place where they threw all the the dead animals, carcasses, and anything filthy and disgusting. They threw it into the valley of Hinnom, and um, and so they would uh, have a very very strong imprint in their mind when Yahshua said to fear the one who has has the power to cast you into Hinnom. Fear him. And so Yahweh gives us a very stern warning here. He desires that we love him in sincerity and in truth. That's what he wants, a sincere and truthful worship, a truthful heart. And so we need to live our lives as though, yes, everything is recorded. There is nothing hidden from the eyes of Yahweh, nothing. And so, how many of us, my question is, are living as though Yahweh does not see? That's an important question for all of us to consider.
Okay. It appears that one of the channels just went out on the video mixer, so we're back in swing of things. Hallelujah. All right. Psalm 73, verse 11. And they say, How does Elohim know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? This is what men were saying in those days. He has said in his heart, Elohim has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. This is what the attitudes of men were in that time. Psalm 94, verse 7. Yet they say, Yahweh does not see, nor does the Elohim of Jacob understand. Understand, you senseless among the people, and you fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? And so, what would change, brothers, if we were if we were truly aware continually of the presence of Yahweh being with us at all times. I mean, it's true. Yahshua, the Messiah, is living in us, correct? And it's no longer we who live, but it's he that lives in us. And so do we fully comprehend that we are supposed to be his body on the earth today, the body of the Messiah, all of us together? And so we ought to have an awareness that we are connected to the head of the body. The head knows what the body is doing, and the body ought to be obedient to his will. Yahweh sees us, brothers, when we are in our cars, in our homes, at our jobs, visits with friends, relatives, wherever we go. No matter where we go, the eyes of Yahweh are there. O oh, Yahweh, you have searched me and have known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. But there, For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O oh, Yahweh, you know it altogether. You have hedged me behind and before, and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. And so wherever we go, Brothers, Yahweh is there. We cannot flee from his presence, and we cannot hide from his face. And now in Ezekiel's day, there were men, though, who thought they could. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 8, and verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the sixth year and the sixth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house, with the elders of Judah sitting before me, that the hand of Yah the Master Yahweh fell upon me there. Then I looked, and there was a likeness, like the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his waist and downward and fire, and from his waist and upward, like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber. He stretched out the form of a hand, and took me by the lock of my hair. And the Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven, and brought me in visions of Elohim to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate of the inner court, where the seat of the image of jealousy was, which provokes to jealousy. And so here 
Ezekiel was being given uh, a vision of what Yahweh is seeing with his eyes. And behold, the glory of Elohim of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the plain. Then he said to me, Son of man, lift your eyes now toward the north. So I lifted my eyes toward the north, and there, north of the altar gate, was this image of jealousy in the entrance. Furthermore, he said to me, Son of man, do you see what they are doing, the great abominations that the house of Israel commits here, to make me go far away from my sanctuary? Now turn again, you will see greater abominations. Now, there's a teaching out there today where people say all sin is the same, all sin is equal, and there's no difference from one sin to the other. That's not true. There are sins that are worse than other sins. And even common sense will tell us that, um, oh, you know, someone telling a mild lie or coveting is not quite as bad as uh, a murder, you know. So um, there are things that are worse than other things. So he brought me to the door of the court, and when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. Then he said to me, Son of man, dig in into the wall, and when I dug into the wall, there was a door. And he said to me, Go in and see the wicked abominations which they are doing there. So I went in and saw, and there every sort of creeping thing, abominable beast, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around on the walls. And there stood before them seventy men of the elders of the house of Israel, and in their midst stood Jehazaniah the son of Shaphan. Each man had a censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. And so then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the house the elders of Israel do in the dark, every man in the room of his idols? For they say, Yahweh does not see us. Yahweh has forsaken the land. So they assumed that they could get away with doing wrong things. Because they... Oh, I see the problem now. <laughs> because they assumed that they were able to do wrong things because they thought that Yahweh was not able to see. He thought that... Yahweh had forsaken the land. But as we can see, obviously, that was not true. And uh, Yahweh had not forsaken the land. Although he had forsaken his sanctuary, he was still able to see them. And so Yahweh revealed to Ezekiel, and now to us, what men thought they were doing in secret. It was all open and bare to Yahweh, and it was very foolish to think they could escape the judgments and warnings in Yahweh's word by hiding. In uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 through 13, it says, For the word of Elohim is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Another example, another example is in when the children of Israel were in the wilderness and they were murmuring. Remember how many times you'll, you'll read in Scripture where they were murmuring against Yahweh. Well, their murmuring was actually um, not necessarily done out in the open because we read here in the book of Psalms, Chapter 106, 24 through 26 says, Then they despised the pleasant land. They did not believe his word, but complained in their tents, and did not heed the voice of Yahweh. Therefore he raised up his hand in an oath against them to overthrow them in the wilderness. And so the, all their murmuring may not necessarily have been out in the open. It may have been something, you know, sort of like, you know, people like to gossip. They get around a little private area somewhere, uh, sometimes at work, sometimes people whisper on the phone or different things, and, um, and so maybe their their whisperings against Yahweh were not done openly, but done privately, and yet Yahweh judged them 
just the same. This is because Yahweh listens to every word that we speak. Matthew chapter 12, verse 35 through 37, The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And so every thought, my brothers, every thought reaches his ears. Every word that's spoken out of those thoughts reaches his ears. And we look around, we don't have to look very far. All we have to do is read the newspaper and you can see how wicked the world is and how every evil imaginable is reported. Now imagine for the moment, just for a moment, imagine the wicked that we see in this world is bad enough, but imagine the things that Yahweh sees and hears as he looks into the hearts of all men. What is being reported to him? What he is able to see? Can you imagine for a minute just all the things that he is seeing and how much restraint he must have? Well, how much mercy he is having upon the sons of men? Because the only thing we see is what's you know, the obvious. But he's watching the things that are done in secret. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 23. Am I an Elohim near at I am, am I an Elohim near at hand and not an Elohim afar off? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him? Says Yahweh. Do I not fill heaven and earth? Says Yahweh. Job 34, 21 through 22, For his eyes are on the ways of man, and he sees all his steps. There is no darkness nor shadow of death where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. And in Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 9, And he said to me, The iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and the land is full of bloodshed, and the city full of perversity. For they say, Yahweh has forsaken the land, and Yahweh does not see. See, all the evil they were doing at the time that they were being destroyed and carried away into Babylon, they recognized that Yahweh existed, and he was, that he was an Elohim to be feared. But they just assumed he wasn't able to see them. They thought that his power was limited. And so they were deceived in thinking that since Yahweh forsook the land, that he was not able to see the things that they were doing. And so this relates to us as believers today, brothers, because we got to ask ourselves, are there times in our life where we've made decisions and chose to live a certain way or do a certain thing as though Yahweh sees not? That's the question only you can answer for yourself. I can't answer it for you. And I have to ask myself the same question. In Job chapter 24, verse 14, it says, The murderer rises with the light. He kills the poor and needy. and In the night he is like a thief. So there's, there's the murderer, and then there's the one who murders with his tongue. There's a tailbearer, and the murderer go hand in hand, see? And then there's the adulterer. It says, The eye of the adulterer waits for the twilight, saying, No eye will see me. And he disguises his face. In the dark, so there's the, the ones that uh, commit adultery with the heart also. In the dark they break into houses which they mark for themselves in the daytime. They do not know the light. And so, once again, we have people that tend to think, well, if I go in the dark where man cannot see, Yahweh will not see. Yahweh says, Jeremiah sixteen seventeen, For my eyes are on all their ways. They are not hidden from my face, nor is their iniquity hidden from my eyes. Yahushua was able to read the thoughts of men in Matthew chapter 9, verse 3 through 4. And at once some of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. 
Yahshua, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? Can you imagine what their reaction had have been? I mean, they're just thinking something. And Yahshua is here responding to their secret thoughts. And they, they must have had this impression that their thoughts were not known to Yahshua, but Yahshua knew the thoughts they were thinking, and he responded to them. And so, a question for us. How is Yahweh responding to our thoughts today? Are our thoughts his delight, or are they a burden to him? Do our thoughts cause rejoicing in heaven, or do they grieve the spirit of Elohim? That's an important question. What is our, what's going on in our thought life is a very important question. Is he rejoicing over your thoughts, or is he grieving over them? And if he's rejoicing over them, I can assure you that he will rejoice over what you're doing, because that's where the battle lies. But if he's grieving over your thoughts, then he's not going to be rejoicing over the things that you're doing, because what you think tends to cause what you do. Now, it was, it was when the thoughts of men were continually wicked that he actually came and destroyed the entire world except for eight souls. And that's in Genesis chapter 6, in verse 5, in verse 6, it says, Then Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And Yahweh was sorry he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And so man, Yahweh was grieving over the thoughts of men. As Yahweh, as awesome as he is, Yahweh can still grieve. He can still grieve. And, it, and the, the word there has to do with a wound, a hurt. And so is Yahweh grieving and hurting over the things that you were thinking, or is he rejoicing over the things that we are thinking? And it was when Yahweh could no longer bear not only their thoughts, but the intent of those thoughts. In other words, he not only knows what we're thinking. He knows why we think them. He knows why we think what we're thinking. He knows the reason for the things that we are thinking. He rules by his power forever. His eyes observe the nations. Do not let the rebellious exalt themselves. He is watching the nations, and he's watching us. Psalm chapter 11, verses 4 through 5. Yahweh is in his holy temple. Yahweh's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. Yahweh tests the righteous. But the wicked... And the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For Yahweh is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. And so from his throne, my brothers... Yahweh knows your thoughts today. He knows what your response is to what I'm saying to you today. He knows why you respond the way you do. He knows what you're thinking, and he knows why you're thinking what you're thinking in response to what I'm sharing with you today. Now David, a man after Yahweh's own heart, spoke to his son Solomon and said, As for you, my son Solomon, know the Elohim of your father and serve him with a loyal heart and with a willing mind. For Yahweh searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. 
but if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. And so he, David's trying to communicate this, the, the man after Yahweh's own heart. David's trying to communicate to his son, he says, look, Yahweh knows all the imaginations of your heart. If you forsake him in your heart, he's going to cast you off. So serve him with a loyal heart and a willing mind, because Yahweh is searching out that heart of yours and understands why you think what you think. You can't trick him. You can't deceive him. See, we're called, brothers, to love Yahweh with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength. And the thoughts of our heart ought to express that love for him down deep. If we love him with all our hearts, then our thoughts will be one of love and dedication to him. And he wants all of our hearts. He don't want just a little part here and a little part there. That's not good enough. He wants it all. And so let's be sure that we confess our sins to him and that we do seek his strength and his wisdom to overcome the things that we're thinking and not according to him, and that may maybe grieve him. And so the next time we enter into temptation, we need to remember that Yahweh is there in observation, wanting to know, what are we going to do? Are we going to love him today or not? And if we love him, we don't want to grieve him. We don't want to hurt him. He is ready to be our strength if we call upon him and seek his face during these temptations. And we need to be willing to look to him to be our strength during those times. Why don't we just be totally transparent with him, be open and honest with him about our struggles? We ought to be transparent because he, he already knows whether we think about that or not. He already knows. And so, our, or maybe we're uh, maybe we're doing okay. All right, maybe we are. But maybe we, are we failing to seek out wisdom? Because maybe we're afraid of what we might find, and then we might have to change. We don't want to change. See, it's all all those little tiny thoughts. He's got that recorded too. Those little intents of our thoughts maybe we're kind of avoiding something not wanting to look at it not wanting to study it because we're afraid of what we might find and we don't really want to change that part of our life and so we go on about assuming that we're doing okay but we're deceiving ourselves and pretending not to know something's wrong when down deep we know it probably is see Yahweh knows that too and so we need to be willing not only to avoid temptation, but to seek out understanding and seek out wisdom so that we can grow and learn new things that we need to perfect and change in our minds. And so are we willing to look to him to be our strength in times of temptation? Are we just going to act like he's not around? Are we going to behave like those who say, oh, well, Yahweh seeth not? Are we going to choose to love him or stray from him and choose another kingdom to follow after? Will we walk in his image as we're created to do? Or are we walking in subtle ways in the image of his enemy? Satan, who does not want to do is the Father's will. So whose side are we really on? Our decisions tell the story. Our decisions tell the story of whose side we're on, who we're serving. And those decisions in our minds, in our hearts, tell the story on Judgment Day. And those thoughts in the heart are going to determine our ultimate destiny. Are we truly repentant in our heart? Are we truly down, down, deep, desirous and zealous to do the will of our Father 
which we know is right. Why don't we say, I'm on Yahweh's side? How about that? Each and every time we're tempted to do what's not pleasing to him, we just say, hey, I'm on Yahweh's side. The battles can be fierce battles, and about every sin begins right there in the mind, those thoughts. And that's where victory is won, or we give in to defeat. And the thoughts of the mind are affected by what the eyes see and what the ears hear. So, what do we do? If we want to win the battle by not even having to engage in it, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Be careful, little ears, what you hear. Let your eyelids look straight ahead. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25 through 27. Especially when you're in town. Let your eyes look straight ahead. And your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Remove your foot from evil. See, our eyes and the direction thereof have a lot to do with where we walk. So he says, let your eyelids look straight ahead. And this is especially true in the eye gate in terms of lust. Proverbs 27, verse 20. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. So Sheol and destruction never say, okay, we've got enough, enough graves. Okay, enough destruction now. Never, never stops. And the eyes of man are never satisfied. We never close our eyes and say, hey, I've, you know what, I've seen enough today. We're always looking at something. And Proverbs is compared to the grave and destruction. The eyes are never satisfied. And so whatever you're looking at, it's not going to be good enough. No point in looking. And so direction, the place that we direct our eyes has a lot to do with where we go. If we're looking to the right, we're probably going to go to the right. If we look, get caught looking back, ooh, that's not good. You know, Shua said no one having... His hand put to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of Yahweh. Don't want to look back. Remember Lot's wife. And so we need to sow good things in our minds and let good things be our meditation. If we think on these things, guess what? You're going to be true, noble, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, and so on. Our meditation has a lot to do with what we become. If we keep our eyes on the straight and narrow path, not turning to the left or to the right, then brothers, we're probably going to remain on that path. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? For the, way, the ways of man are before the eyes of Yahweh, and he ponders all his paths. Now, Yahshua pointed out, we don't have to physically embrace the strange woman. All we got to do is think about her. If I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so, here we have, he's saying to his son, why should you be enraptured by an immoral woman? In this case, embraced, but in this case, in the heart, have already embraced. Now, this is not a new thing Yahshua is teaching here He's, because uh, it says in the Tenth Commandment, don't covet your neighbor's wife. Not a new thing. Don't even desire her. Don't desire the things that don't belong to you. And if the woman don't belong to you, don't desire her whether she's married or unmarried. She's not yours. The eyes of Yahweh are in every place keeping watch on the evil and the good. Now Job 
a man whom Yahweh called blameless, feared Elohim, who skewed evil, he hated evil. He knew this. And so he said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of Elohim from above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the works of iniquity? Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? Make your covenant with your eyes like he did. You won't even think about the woman because your eyes are not going there. Very wise thing. He knew his eyes would influence what his mind thought, and his mind, what his mind thought would, inf would affect what his body does. And he recognized that Yahweh counted his steps, verse 4, and sees all his ways. And that destruction is for those who do those things. And disaster. Then he said, If I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot hath hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales, that Elohim may know my integrity. So we're not called to walk in falsehood, are we? Or deceive people. Sometimes the two go hand in hand, the lust and the deceit. If my step has turned from the way, or my heart walked after my eyes, or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me sow and another eat. Yes, let my harvest be rooted out. See how his heart, that's where the thoughts are in the heart, walking after the eyes. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another, and let others bow down over her, for that would be wickedness. Yes, it would be iniquity deserving of judgment, for what would be a fire, that would be a fire that consumes destruction and would root out all my increase. And so, brothers... We got to recognize that we're called to walk at a very high level of integrity. This is how we ought to walk and receive the praise of Elohim, even as Job did. Yahweh says that he counts our steps. Think about that. He's actually counting our steps. He's numbered the hairs of our head. And just ponder that next time you enter into temptation, how valuable you are to him, how important what you do is to him. And we begin to put value upon him as he puts value upon us. We begin to walk in his image. Then the good things will become our meditation and not the things that are harmful to our spirit. Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the unrighteous, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. See, first, you tend to walk, and then you tend to stand, and then you sit there. See how the progression goes? You don't want to walk there where they walk. Or you might stand there and stare at it for a while, then you might sit there. So don't go there. Don't even look there. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh, and his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. And so as we meditate on Yahweh's law, his words being placed in our hearts, the words of faith are being placed within us, it's going to sow good things, things that are right, that are just, that are good. What will happen? We'll become right, we'll become just, we'll become good. Hallelujah! And we'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit. Now, a tree that's planted by the waters don't have to worry about drought, the dry season. 
don't have to be concerned about the desert land. It doesn't have to be concerned when the rains don't come because they're planted by the waters. And in times of trouble and times of temptation that, that seek to drag us down, when, when our delight is in the law of Yahweh and in His law we meditate day and night, we'll be like that tree. It's not going to wither. We're planted by the waters. If we haven't been reading the word of Yahweh, we may actually be deceived into thinking, hey, we're doing all right. You know why? Because we don't realize our sin. We haven't been focusing on the just and the holy and good things. And so we think we're doing okay. But it's only when we're reading Yahweh's word often and he's teaching us, and yet we're still walking in victory, that we can truly say, hey, praise Yahweh, I'm, I'm doing very well right now. So that's a very important thing. The, the, the word, the direction our eyes are looking, and what's going on in our heart in a continual um, realization that the eyes of Yahweh are in every place, beholding the evil, and the good. And that's what I want to talk about next. Is I've been telling you a lot about what Yahweh is doing when we, he sees the wrong things. But you need to realize something very important. Because as terrible a thought as Yahweh's judgment would be upon one whose thoughts are evil continually. I also want us to consider the blessings and the rewards from Yahweh if our actions and thoughts are secretly good. Because Yahweh weighs every thought, whether good or not so good. Jeremiah 32, verse 19. You are in great counsel and mighty and work, for your eyes are open to all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And so, whether it's good or bad, he's just going to give us according to our ways and our thoughts and our doings. Second Chronicles 16, verse 9, For the eyes of Yahweh run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Imagine that. The eyes of Yahweh running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. And he's talking to, uh, I think it's Ahaz there, or Azza. But, the point is that Yahweh wants to show himself strong to the person whose heart is loyal, whose thoughts are loyal. What's going on in the mind? His, his, if your thoughts are loyal, he's going to show himself strong to you. If your heart is right in his eyes, he's going to show himself strong to you. And how you're going to see how powerful he truly is. You're going to see the awesome power of Yahweh in your life. And so if we're not walking in the ways of hypocrisy, but we're doing the righteous things that only Yahweh may see, well, that pleases him greatly. And I can tell you, yes, you're looking at a man right now on the video screen, if you have that in front of you, who um, has let his thoughts stray to the wrong things before. And even this week, I've had wrong thoughts. And so I'm not coming to you as a fellow on a high perch scowling at you. I'm coming to you as a brother and, and coming alongside you and saying, hey, we need to get this right. We need to get this right. We don't want to be hypocrites. We want to do the righteous things that maybe only Yahweh sees it. And that will please him greatly. It shows that we care about him. It really does. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, it says, For the eyes of Yahweh are on the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of Yahweh is against those who do evil. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6. But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. It is an act, is an act of faith to go into a prayer closet and pray. And believe. He told them, pray secretly. 
there's many hypocrites in the streets making long prayers as a show to men, trying to show men how holy they are. Those men aren't really praying to Yahweh. They're just praying for the sake of the glory of self, a selfish prayer. And the ones who pray secretly and humbly are the ones that are seen by Yahweh in secret, and he will reward them openly. It shows that their heart is loyal toward Yahweh. Same thing with our almsgiving. Um, we give alms in such a way to receive glory from men. Well, we received our reward. Yahshua taught us that. We do these things in secret. Our alms would be in secret. And your Father which sees in secret will reward you openly. You know, my trials <laughs> this week, I guess somebody heard that my house caught, or not the house, but the... Uh, storage building caught on fire and and decided to to bless me in secret they sent a a money order from a mystery location for a hundred and fifty five dollars and praise Yahweh for that they are giving in secret and I know Yahweh is going to reward them openly whoever they are and if you're if you're the person watching thank you uh, really helps but you know brothers it's all about uh, what Yahweh sees and not about what man sees. And when we, through the fears, through the tears, through the trials, choose to do the right things, the things that are good, that are just, through the temptations, we choose the right things, that's like an offering to Yahweh. Yahweh sees everything. And he, and he who knows our every wondering, is going to do something very special for us. As we cry out to him. You number my wonderings. Put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? You notice he's, he's actually got our tears in his bottle. And in his book. He's noticing the good things. When I cry out to you, then my enemies will turn back. This I know because Elohim is for me. In Elohim I will praise his word. In Yahweh I will praise his word. In Elohim I have put my trust. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Our secret thoughts and our secret actions are recorded, good or evil. And we need to have that continual awareness of his presence and store up those treasures for the age to come. Because our, our thoughts and our actions and they either advance Yahweh's kingdom and the things that he's trying to accomplish on the earth today or they're advancing the kingdom that's risen up against him. And so let's ask Yahweh to cleanse our thought life so that our works also may be clean. And let's bring every thought in every secret work, in the subjection of Yahweh our Father, and thereby build up those treasures. Second Corinthians chapter six, four, ten, verses four through six. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in Elohim for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of the Messiah. Are we doing that? Every thought, taking it captive, grabbing a hold of it, put it in a box, and throw it away if it's garbage. Take that thought, if it's garbage, if it's no good, if it's not of Yahweh, it's not wholesome, not lovely, and not right, take that thought, put it in a box, and throw it in the garbage can and burn it. And, verse 6, be ready to punish all disobedience. One day we're going to punish the men as judges and kings of the earth, reigning with Messiah. We're going to judge men and angels for their disobedience. And so we need to get, get our hearts right. We need to get our hearts right. 
so that our works may be clean. And because one day we're going to be expected not only to overcome these things, but to punish those who haven't. That's a thought, isn't it? So, my brothers and, and, and my sisters, let's be aware of the eyes of Yahweh. Because, and I know it seems like, you know, as we're trying to live the right way, we look look around us and all the wicked <clears throat> that are not living right, they seem to be prospering and seem to be doing well and they seem happy for some reason. But there's one psalm that continually I, I, I think in my mind when I see these things. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree, yet he passed away. And behold, was no more, and indeed I saw him, and could not be found. Mark the blameless man, and observe the upright. For the future of that man is peace. But the transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. But the salvation of the righteous is from Yahweh. He is their strength in a time of trouble. And Yahweh shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because, what? They trust in him. And that's what we need to be. Ones who trust in Yahweh. Mark the blameless man. Observe the upright. The future of that man is shalom. He may not look like he's got it now, but it's there. Another verse I skipped accidentally. Psalm 17, verse 3. You have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me and have found nothing. I have purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Another good verse is Psalm 19, one of my favorites in all of Scripture. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Yahweh, my strength and my Redeemer. And so, brothers, let's never forget that although Yahweh is in heaven above, He's still near enough to be pondering our thoughts and our works, and for that we can rejoice or tremble. Let's be at the point where we can always rejoice at the knowledge that He understands and knows and approves of our thoughts and rejoice at the thought of his presence being with us knowing every thought and every deed and so let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter Ecclesiastes 12 13 through 14 fear Elohim and keep his commandments for this is man's all for Elohim will bring every work into judgment including every secret thing whether it be good or evil. And may our thoughts be a lovely, holy, pure offering unto Him forever and ever, with every secret thing being pure, upright, and good in His sight. Every secret thing that's against Him, brethren. We can look back and say there is grace available. We just need to confess to Him what He already knows. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, Yahweh, He wants us, He wants to forgive us. And if we have sinned, then our heart needs to be, oh no. Yahweh, will you forgive me? I admit I've done wrong. No excuses. He wants us to overcome. He wants to help us overcome. And so we can seek His help diligently. And through that, we show a love for Him. Hear, O Yisrael, Yahweh our Elohim, Yahweh is one. You shall love Yahweh with all your heart, 
with all your soul and with all your strength. Brothers, he wants to reward us with blessing, sweet blessing, sweet blessing. Let's journey to reality where the things of this world are only temporary, as I've learned this week. And the ages to come are what's worthy of our attention and worthy of our devotion. Yahweh has given so much to us. And he wants to give us so much more. Let's give back to him the sweet love he's given to us. If we will do this, the eyes of Yahweh beholding our actions and our thoughts is a concept that will be very pleasant to our hearts. May Yahweh bless you, and may Yahweh have mercy on us all.